Every week on CyberWork, listeners ask us the same question. What cybersecurity skills should I learn? Well, try this. Go to infosecinstitute.com slash free to get your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. It's got in-depth training plans for the 12 most common roles, including SOC analyst, penetration tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, and more. We took notes from employees and a team of subject matter experts to build training plans that align with the most in-demand skills. You can use the plans as is or customize them to create a unique training plan that aligns with your own unique career goals. One more time, just go to infosecinstitute.com slash free or click the link in the description to get your free training plans, plus many more free resources for cyber work listeners. Do it. Infosecinstitute.com slash free. Now, on with the show. Lisa Tatro of Arctic Wolf joins me to talk about the adhesives that hold cybersecurity together. I'm talking about communication, collaboration, and strong teams. First, Lisa discusses how public speaking at conferences and events made her a better cybersecurity professional. Second, she talks about how her work mentoring cybersecurity students helps them fast track their way into the cybersecurity community. And third, with her work in organizations like Women in Cyber and CyberX, she helps bring diverse cybersecurity professionals into the community, builds stronger, more multifaceted teams, and with them, a more multifaceted face of the industry. I found Lisa to be an inspiring thinker and leader, and I'm looking forward to having you all meet her as well. So keep it right here for CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Lisa Tetro is Senior Director, Global Security Operations at Arctic Wolf. In her current role, Lisa is responsible for spearheading external and internal initiatives run by Arctic Wolf's SOC team. With over two decades of experience in the cybersecurity and enterprise technology industry, uh, Lisa has worked for powerhouse companies like IBM and BlackBerry. In her spare time, Lisa also volunteers her efforts towards group groups like CyberX and Women in Cybersecurity to help mentor the next generation of cybersecurity professionals. And that's what we're gonna be talking about. We've got some uh, uh, some very good um, uh, skills that we can talk about uh, in terms of career development, in terms of soft skills, in terms of, as you said, enabling the next generation, which are all things we're very excited about. So Lisa, thank you very much for joining me and welcome to CyberWork. Thank you, Chris, excited to be here. Uh, thank you, Ed. I'm excited to have you. So uh, to start with, uh, I like to get to know our guests by, uh, you know, uh, tracing their interests and their sort of origin story. So where did you first get interested in computers and tech? <laughs> and what specifically drew you to a career in cybersecurity? I mean, I see that you had a bachelor's in computer science and software engineering. So I'm assuming it goes a while back. But what what got you excited about it initially? <laughs> I'll probably date myself here, but I loved the Atari. Oh, yeah. 2600. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I love playing video games. Dodgem was my game of choice. I don't oh, know yeah. if you remember that uh, game or heard Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Um, so early in my life, my dad actually brought home a computer, and I remember mm. uh, breaking it continuously breaking it. Uh, but I was fascinated with it. Um, but uh, any Breaking time, it by trying to learn more about it? Absolutely. Yes, exactly. right, right, right. Uh, my dad always knew uh, that I had been playing with it because he would come home, turn it on, go to do, use it, and it was broken uh, all the time. Uh, so it was Lisa. quite fun. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but I also love playing board games and puzzles. Mm -hmm. um, and I played a lot of sports growing up, individual and team sports. Um, mm -hmm. My preference was always team sports. And when I reflect back, cyber, you know, when I reflect back on cyber, um, I believe that cybersecurity is really a big team sports game uh, because you know, while we have very smart individuals here, there's like a lot of creativity that happens and we're more effective as a community operating as a team and solutioning oh, yeah. uh, ways and either stop bad actors or solving puzzles and problems. So um, that's kind of how you know, when I reflect back, when I reflect back, that's all those things together got me kind of into this. So, you know, the Atari, the computers early on, that's how yeah. I, I kind of got into it. Yeah, the problem solving and yeah. the sort of build, you know, the sort of build and rebuild and the sort of test for stress factors. Absolutely. Plus the sort of team component. I mean, you feel like you've 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 just sort of said cybersecurity without saying cybersecurity. So that's for really sure. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so I like to get a sense of our guest's career journey by, you know, uh, snooping around your LinkedIn page a little bit. So I wanted to ask you about how you move from uh, network analysis and uh, network analyst to network technician into data analysis for IBM and BlackBerry to your current role as head of global security operations at Arctic Wolf. So was there a point where you wanted to move away from networking and data into security or was this the pro uh, progression that you sort of envisioned all along? Yeah. So let's back up just even a little bit further um, okay. into my like undergrad. So let's start with even high school, I enjoyed math. And I so I decided to go into an undergrad at Western University in London. And um, in high school, um, I was kind of exposed to like dial up internet there. And I think, I think maybe it was even in high school, again, maybe, maybe university. Um, it was always like a journey, like many others, there was progression that many people evolved into. Um, so I was good at math, I wasn't really passionate about it. Um, and then I found this course in university it was comp sci, I loved it. And then I did this internship at the bank. And in Canada, you did it for 16 months. You took a year off between um, in university between third and fourth year. And what I ended up doing was I got this internship and it was in, I did scripting. And what happened was there was a reorg at the bank and I ended up in the networking team. And there what happened was is I found this passion for networking. I had not been exposed in any of my, my university at that point um, to networking. And I hit the jackpot. I found I hit the jackpot. And then I got exposure to firewalls, routers, switches, and internet yep. connectivity and how all things worked. And I found it like, I love this. And okay. so yeah. I, how systems were connected. And like, and then I realized like all the fun things happened at night at a bank because people bank mm -hmm. during the day. Right. And so, you know, you did all the planning for changes, you know, when customers were, you know, you know, banking, you did all the planning. And then at night, you got to actually play with things. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. So then I it ended up finding a passion with operating things and, and mm -hmm. incident management. So all of my journey and, and kind of pivoting around ended up being an operations and incident response. So the majority oh, yeah. of my learning happened during those pieces. So I pulled that through over my career at large, like all those enterprise companies that you had mentioned, like, you know, IBM and BlackBerry, um, and then standby. And so I dabbled in a bit of security and incident response, and then I ended up in security operations. And, mm -hmm. and so like each of those companies, it kind of taught me a little bit about being in security at each point. So from interfacing with customers, and then when situations were really difficult, or when customers were in their darkest moment, I was like, I was able to kind of, you know, help them out. And then I, I learned in each of the career, each of the aspects of my career, like how to conduct postmortems or how mm -hmm. to, you know, lessons learned or, you know, access and least privilege or, you know, preventative measures, hardening of systems. I learned at right. IBM, you know, auditing and SOC 2 and ISO controls and insider activities. And each piece of it was like teaching me a little bit about the other. So it wasn't like I saw something and I pivoted. It was I evolved and I took on something new and it was always a new project or, you know, I, I always had that network theme, but then I would end up in learning something more about security. And at one point it was like, okay, enough of this, you know, doing a side hustle of security. I'm just going to go all in. And I had all these pieces of security that I had learned along the way. That's how I ended up here. And so yeah. all of those things prepared me. And, and then it was just, it was a natural movement in there. Yeah, again, listening to the the enthusiasm you had for networking again just uh, speaks to your your excitement about problem solving and sort of you know clearing blockages and and things like that and the way all of it is like you're you know you're a really major player in sort of making a a, a finished working product like that and and that excitement uh, seems sure. to have, have have absolutely sort of fueled your your career car the whole uh, the whole stretch of the way <laughs> absolutely. Um, so yeah, so thank you for 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 the the, the walk through history there. So Lisa uh, came to our podcast with uh, some topic ideas that I think um, are absolutely crucial for cybersecurity professionals at all points in their careers. Mm -hmm. So you know we have had many guests talk about things like networking and security and the nuts and bolts and the DNS uh, over HTTP and all the all that mm -hmm. kind of thing. But um, uh, 
you know, and those are crucial as well. But I'm I'm very much into the idea of uh, of of the professional development, the soft skills, the you know, the quote unquote soft skills. We talk about that; they're actually pretty hard sometimes. But uh, uh, Lisa wanted to talk about how public speaking and presenting keynote speeches has mm-hmm. helped her become a stronger security professional. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, our listeners are probably tired of hearing me talk about this, but I'll just keep <laughs> saying it anyway. A hugely deficient skill set in security. Uh, is the ability to communicate, whether in written reports, presentation to your team or your C-suite, or telling, conf- uh, you know, or even telling conference attendees about your findings. You know, there's only so many scanning tools you can master, but you can always improve your communication game. So, Lisa, uh, can you tell me about your public speaking experience, your personal approach to communication, and how this improved other aspects of your security skills? Sure, Chris. So, I attended like many conferences over the years, and I quickly realized that. Many of them were telling, you know, sharing their experiences and their stories. And a lot of these experiences I also had. Um, So I started by, uh, you know, smaller conferences. I did Mm -hmm. a few webinars and they were short and a lot of them were online. So I could use little cheat sheets. Okay. Uh, So that also helped me kind of get out there and and not really worry uh, about having people in front of me. I wasn't so scared. Right. Yes. And I did a few webinars that way. And then I talked to students who were breaking into the space. Um, so it wasn't so daunting, you know, having all these experts out, you know, out there, yes. uh, you know, getting the cold feet. Um, and then as I grew uh, confidence and I built that confidence, I was able to, you know, speak at larger conferences. Mm-hmm. Um, I put in a long shot proposal for a larger conference. Uh, it was a topic about uh, a couple of anon- on anon- uh, anonymous compromises mm-hmm. um, in breaking into the field, um, something that my team and I were kind of dealing with on a daily basis. And um, I actually took for granted something um, that I dealt with all the time and didn't realize that others really didn't, you know, understand and deal with on a regular basis. And I mm-hmm. kind of put poured hun- hours and hours into preparing for it. Um, and afterwards, I was kind of bombarded with feedback from the conference, mm-hmm. um, from a lot of people coming up and talking to me. And then what I kind of realized was there was such a great um, way to also network. People were coming up and saying, oh, you know, can we talk about this? Or can I ask you a question about that? And it ended up spawning off um, other ideas for other con- um, other conference talks. So, oh, they want to know about this. And I started getting the same questions about something I had talked about that I also knew a lot about. So it ended up being a spiral event. So I, oh, yeah. you know, I never thought of that. And then I ended up, you know, that was the next topic um, that I would present at the next conference. And it ended up being really good. And then I would meet these people and I would go to their webinars or their conferences. Right. And um, there's a couple of people I actually met when I was there. And recently I had, you know, for instance, I had a training um, curriculum. We were trying to build on one of the training things that we were doing at our company. And uh, one of the ladies that I had met with, she's in the training space and I had reached out to her. And then it's like, it's kind of, you know, we're building off of each other's skills. And so what I learned through this whole process was, uh, you know, how to articulate, you know, on a, on a slide, what that looks like, you mm-hmm. know, the thought process about using fewer words to get your point across being articulate. Right the preparation. And, and really what, what that helps me do is be more articulate and thoughtful about my words and how to kind of bring people in. Um, you know, I've been to many conferences and, um, you know, a lot of times on these conferences that you attend, you get a free ticket if you are a presenter. Yes. So if you if you like going to conferences and you like to attend them and, and hear what others are having to say, um, that's a great way to, to attend, right? Oh, yeah. um, and for me, it also helped me um, learn a lot more about areas that I'm not as confident about or right. understood or skilled or, or what have you. And it also helped me kind of pivot into other areas of cyber <laughs> that I'm not well-versed in. So um that way, I mean, for me, if you're able to articulate your thoughts and your views, you're better able to represent what's needed in the cyber community. Oh, and yeah. it also advances your career. I mean, it's like it's a twofold, like it's a it's a 360 and it really helps you along the way. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I like I, I want to sort of break out, break into a, a couple of those things. So when you said uh, when you were doing it online, you had uh, cheat sheets to, to help you along now uh, to, you know, in, in, in more recent times, do you. Do you speak extemporaneously? Do you speak from a script? Like, does when you say cheat sheet, do you mean like you know you had the facts at hand in case someone asked you a question? Or yes. oh, okay. Mm-hmm. So I would have uh, a lot of times you practice like you've got your bullet points. You might have a fact sheet. So if you wanted to weave in a fact, 
Got into it. something you're presenting, you have your source and the and the you know percentage. If you had mm-hmm. a bullet point of percentages, or um, you obviously need to prepare. You can't be reading your notes through yes. because yes. people okay. will obviously know. Great, um, but you know you present, you practice uh, that type of thing. Um, but then you're able to you know articulate your words and and it comes kind of naturally there. And then mm-hmm. it's kind of like your crutch because sometimes when people present in front of people, they've got their their notes and it's it's their crutch and they can kind of look down. Yeah. It's not necessarily as obvious if you're online. I mean, okay. people that you're reading, but you still have your, your bullet points there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you have any, do you have any tips for, or for sort of breaking the, 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 the scripted, uh, scripted crutch to, you know, get rid of the sort of training wheels. And, and cause I'm assuming that it's a lot more engaging if you're able to sort of speak extemporaneously and not get freaked out by and stuff like that. So, and that feels like sort of like learning to play piano with two hands, like one day you can't do it. And then suddenly you can just keep trying, but like, what are your tips for, for doing, doing that where you can just take bullet points and turn it into sort of free flowing awesomeness? Yeah. Um, what I used to do when I was practicing for anything like that is I would definitely um, do a lot more. Um, I, I would start with a lot of words and then I would pare down my words into, you know, shorter sentences, practice, practice, practice. I would do slide by slide and I would just nail down the slide mm-hmm. um, and then I would start shortening up those sentences and then I would get it down to a word. And then I would just go and go and go. And it takes hours to practice a lot, uh, especially your first couple. And then as you do this more often, a lot of times you just repurpose. Mm -hmm. And when you repurpose your slides, you you know what you're saying. And it comes with time. It gets easier. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does get easier, a lot easier over time, for sure. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to to, uh, go back to a little bit was, you know, learning from other people at presentations. Um, can you speak to, you know, maybe, do you see that there's maybe a, a feeling amongst people who might, you know, want to present at these things that they just want to get their information out there uh, and don't care about all the rest of it? Like, how do you, you know, how do you sort of communicate with those people the importance of adding your words to the community, but also taking taking their ideas, you know, back and, and strengthening yourself? Um, so from like a new student perspective or mm-hmm. in what yeah, way? someone just getting into the game, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, and again, I'm, I'm speaking simultaneously here, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think when you get started, you know, you feel like you have those sort of like, I have this one piece of information that I can impart and, mm-hmm. you know, you get a little worried if you're, you know, asked too many questions about it or whatever. And so you, you know, maybe you don't look too far left or right or whatever, but, um, sure. you know, if you're, if you're feeling a little like tight, you got the cold feet, you got the whatever. But you know, I, I and again, I'm, I'm imagining that if you're seeing lots of other presentations, you're seeing people at different levels of competency, and maybe that would help sure. with your own sort of concerns. But yeah, I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, what I find is that local meetups, and um, you know, you don't have to go to the big conferences, but smaller conferences. Besides, mm-hmm. you can also do blogging. Uh, you can write a some sort of an article on LinkedIn. There's there's yep. other ways to share that information out doesn't necessarily even have to be public speaking you Mm -hmm. can also i know um there's like cybersecurity meetups here locally in our um chapter in in waterloo if you're a student there's local chapters there um like come to your chapters that you can join and and share and practice sharing that information and get feedback and then when you get that feedback what you do is you then you iterate on it because there might be a point of view that you didn't consider and then again that goes to that whole iteration that i was talking about when you present something somebody gives you some other aspect of it that you hadn't considered or oh i didn't even make that pivot or that connection and then you go away and it gives you another topic um so so from my point of view there's there's other mechanisms a podcast i mean you can go talk to somebody on a podcast you can um Mm -hmm. you can you can blog there's there's other ways to get that that message out too for sure yeah um in turn you related to that if if you know you have students or 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 people just getting started who want to uh cultivate this skill but they maybe don't have uh, you know, uh, venues to do so. Obviously, mm-hmm. I think podcasts or yeah. or local meetups is a great uh, point. But do you have a way of sort of 
you know, getting your name out there as as sort of a beginner who could speak at these, you know, conferences, even if it's at the, you know, at, at the at the beginner's table or whatever. Like, how, how do you sort of promote yourself in that regard? For sure. So a uh, couple of team members that I had been mentoring, I, I had them start to do some Toastmasters, for instance, because oh, they yeah. were very, very scared to get out and present. So first, let's start, you know, presenting on a topic that has nothing to do with cyber, but just get out there and get that muscle kind of yeah. you know, start to develop it. Um, I also find that getting out and um, introducing yourself to people at an event is another step. You can start to mm, develop those yes, things yes. Um, and, and talk to them about something, anything is also putting yourself out there. If you're not, not really sure. Um, Co-presenting is another way uh, uh, yeah. because you can talk, talk about a topic and maybe you alternate on slides or thoughts, a part of the presentation. It's not so daunting, especially if you're co-presenting with an experienced presenter, because then they're also going to impart on you some of the uh, knowledge that they have and experience and they can, they can practice with you. I remember when I was first starting to present, I also recorded myself um, and I would record myself in then I would go back and say, oh, I didn't like how that was delivered. I didn't, I didn't yeah. like how that was delivered. And it it would be weeks prior, a lot, a lot further ahead, you would have to prepare, but then you were able to kind of iterate on it. Um, and, and so that, that was helpful, but being at like a CompTIA chapter or a, a local WESIS, uh, which is women in cyber, mm -hmm. um, a local cybersecurity meetup group is also a great way because it's a smaller group. Sometimes a lot of times they're not recorded. So yep. if you flub it, it's gone. You don't have to worry about it. There's no <laughs> social media for you to remember forever and feel terrible about right. it. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and that also kind of helps you. You can also, another thing that I learned to do early on in my career was, have somebody in there that you trust and have them give you true and honest feedback about what you did well and what you could work on. And then you have that person that will all like kind of give you that feedback. And then you know what you did well, because I think a lot of times we're so critical of ourselves when we go into these things, it's like, Oh, that, that went really well. You would have never thought I just want to focus on what I need to do next or yes. what I need to do better. Right. But right. you miss your wins. So, mm -hmm. you know, having that, that person there will also kind of help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as someone has to, who has to go through his own podcast to uh, do various clip timings, also the skill of being able to listen to your own voice without upchucking is <laughs> is going to take a little work, but uh, it, it is for worth sure. it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. You know, so there's those certain days where it's like I have to get this done, but oh, I have to listen to myself for an hour, and it's not great. Uh, <laughs> Finding a friend to edit might also be good. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you yeah, if mm -hmm. you got the money, do it. Um, so. Um, you know, we're we're speaking mostly here about people who want to break into public speaking in the security space. But if you're someone who is terrified of it or don't, doesn't consider yourself good at it, but also you know that you have to do it, uh, do you have any suggestions for making it, if not fun, then at least tolerable? Yes, um, I think just uh, setting some milestones for yourself is probably a good thing. Mm -hmm. Like again, like if you're at a meetup and you just cringe at even talking to people, make right. it a point to, I'm going to introduce myself to three people, yeah. um, finding people that are like you mm -hmm. and doing it together is also a good thing to do. Um, um, you don't have to start out with public speaking to get your message out. If that is something that you have to do for your career um, or a developmental item for you, then then that that's what you have to do. lean in and find like-minded people or mentor or somebody that can help you. Again, yep. I really like the idea of co-presenting with oh, yeah. someone who has that that muscle. Um, there's a lot of conferences that do like the co-presenter. Another thing that really works for presentations is there's some conferences that do workshops. So you don't have to stand up there and talk the whole time. You give people homework or like work to do. They do some work and then you kind of present at that. That gives you a break. So it's not all about you. It's kind of, you know, in the audience, those types of presentations and workshops uh, go a long way for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also another one, uh, a style of, of workshop that that works well for people that are in there um, that have expertise to share. Yep. Um, 
And I'm sure you like communicating with people over time, like you're going to develop a better skill set and yes. comfort level. Right. Um, and again, you don't have to start out with public speaking blogs, yeah. And, yeah. you know, sharing information. Um, you know, you, you'll get it down. You'll get it down. Yeah, I know that if I'm at a, a conference and feel like, you know, kind of adrift or whatever, if I if I know a few people there, I'll introduce myself, you know, to people I already know, because you just you get a few wins going and then you're like, oh, this is, you know, this is easy. I don't know what I was worried about. And then you can just start just pressing the flesh, you know, to your heart's content. Uh, For yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, even extroverts, like I'm an extrovert. I get people out. So if you're, a, you know, more introverted mm-hmm. in nature, like. I understand. I understand. Mm-hmm. It's it's not it's not uh, something that you, you sometimes have to get dialed up for it. So yeah. um, having the conditions right, if if you're in a place where there's a thousand people, it's probably not the great condition. So you know, leaning yourself into um, like a better condition that's more for you, like a smaller conference is probably yeah. a better place for you. Um, so consider those conditions that would set you better up for success. Is is another area that I would suggest. That is, a, that is an excellent insight. Thank you. So mm-hmm. uh, another uh, topic that you you mentioned that you'd like to discuss that I'm, I'm very excited about is is volunteerism at a student and university level to help the next generation of security professionals to achieve their goals. Uh, so I'll say that a number of my guests have described their extensive mentoring experience, uh, albeit maybe to some mostly to workplace professionals, but I've definitely seen that a nice chunk of the security industry sees the benefits of paying their gifts forward and, and receives, you know, as much back in return. So uh, first off, do you have do you work with any existing volunteer or mentor groups? And if so, can you re- recommend places to start to start looking for places to put yourself into? OK, so a lot of the universities and organizations have um, groups that do this as part of their organization. So I'm just going to list off a couple. So on LinkedIn, I would suggest you create a profile and then follow cyber companies and programs. First of Mm -hmm. all, if you're a student at a local chapter university, um, there's, there's groups like CompTIA groups, there's WESIS groups, there's, um, you know, all sorts of groups there. Many businesses are starting to do talks and with affiliates and they're supporting those groups. So get in there because they also often offer mentorship, even like a one-time mentorship or an ongoing mentorship. Join a club if you are, or even if you're not a student. Mm-hmm. Um, Blacks and Cyber, Wesis, Out in Tech, Cyber Jitsu. Again, many of the businesses are starting to sponsor them. Um, go on Twitter. Uh, Twitter has a lot of followings there. Um, and a lot of the companies there, they're giving you a lot of insight. And when they tweet things out, they have mentorship programs now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to have uh, out there now, like programs once a year or twice a year that say, hey, we've got this mentorship program that we're kicking off. You know, please come and you know, let us know, apply, attend these. Um, there's a lot of affordable local conferences now, like B-Sides, for instance, um, that they also have mentorship opportunities there. Um, and for me, a lot of times I've had cold calls with people that have said, hey, you know, I, I'm following you on LinkedIn. Um, your path through networking has been intriguing. I'm doing a pivot into um, cyber. You know, can I just, you know, have a conversation um, and, and see, like, I just have a couple of questions. Yeah. I am very willing. I think a lot of people are very willing to have conversations. I know other people may not have the same experience. I know I very much am am open to having conversations with people. I also know a lot of my staff are very open to having conversations with people. And uh, these meetups that I'm talking about, you Mm -hmm. know, you find them, they're free, you meet up and, and you have the conversation there too. Yeah. Now, um, what what uh, sort of things do you do specifically as a security volunteer with students? Do you act as a, a career counselor or a sounding board? Do you check their homework? Do you, mm-hmm. you know, what do you what do you find students need to hear that they aren't hearing in their uh, educational lives that volunteers like you can impart? Yeah. So I think in some of the universities, they sometimes have some industry professionals come in at nighttime and do a talk. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes the students may or may not make time for, you know, industry professionals to come in. They're like, oh, I don't ever want to work at that company. Right. And they shouldn't be necessarily looking at it from a company perspective. That person hasn't only worked at that company. A lot of times they've worked at 20 other companies or five other companies, and they may have had a path that is like wildly crazy that have got them there. And they might say something that has resonates with them. So first thing that I look for is like, 
what are you looking for? Um, what I'm not going to come and tell you, you can't say to me, you know, I don't know what to do with my career. I'm going to say, okay, what are you interested in? Like, right. I am looking for somebody with very clear, like, yeah. you know, I am struggling with this or, you know, what do you, what do you want to get out of this? I am right. very, I, I'm not going to go and be able to give you a, a very direct path into certain things. But if you come to me with some direction as to, you know, I'm struggling between this and this, I'm going to say, well, do you like this or do you like that? Or, mm-hmm. um, you know, these are the things I enjoy. These are the things I don't enjoy. Let's have that conversation. Or yep. I can't break this this into this, like, let's have a different conversation. So the more, the more, you know, like the more narrow you are on what you're looking for in a mentor, I think it's a lot easier. It it is for, you know, the, the cyber community to help you if I'm being honest, Mm -hmm. because, you know, that clarity is going to help you get the answers you need. I'm going to tell you right now, I, you know, I am a lot more effective as a mentor to people. And I, I'm also very picky with my mentors. Like I, I might have like nine mentors at any given time Mm because I'm going to them with a very specific skill set. I'm looking to develop this, you, you embody this, this is what I'm looking for. And, and they help me with that. Mm -hmm. So That's what I find to be useful for me. It's worked for me. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I'm glad you you also mentioned the the part about um, you know not handing it directly. I didn't want to interrupt before, but you know, I had, we have another former guest who uh, every time she's on, she gets 50 requests for uh, advice and things, and she said so many of them get on you know a Zoom call with her for five minutes and say, I don't I don't know where to start. I don't know, you know, and then just kind of like you know, can you cut my hamburger up for me or something like that? It's like uh, you know, so you do you definitely uh want to be uh cognizant of not wasting your your mentor's time uh and and actually know what your question is and so forth but yeah i think there's there's a lot to be said for um you know i think everyone in college feels already a little bit or you know taking studying independently feels a little unmoored in terms of like what is this all for and how do i you know apply it appropriately and so it is definitely super helpful to get someone with you know real world experience who can say yeah watch out for this or don't don't spend so much time on that yeah i always i always tell a lot of people that i talk to like there's this thing called the nice framework and ice and i tell people like that is the world of cyber all the jobs you can think of all the disciplines Mm -hmm. like it's huge so when you say i don't know what i want to do i'm like i don't even know what i want to do so (laughs) like (laughs) Mm -hmm. i don't know what i'm gonna do i'm certainly not gonna be able to help you know what you're gonna want to do so (laughs) yeah but the good news is is that there's uh there's plenty of activity sheets that you can sort of print out and say if you like this then try this if you like this then try this this. exactly and this is what this would look like and this is what a day in life of this looks like for sure yeah and it's another another thing that I say way too often, but like, you know, no, no decision you make is permanent. You know, if you, right. you're like, this seems like the best thing ever. And then you're later, you're like, Ugh, this is the worst thing ever. Then right? do something else. <laughs> yeah. Do something else. It doesn't For really, sure. it's a okay. So um, you also mentioned in our initial conversation that you work with groups like women in cybersecurity and cyber X, and you just mentioned cyber jitsu, which mm-hmm. we love uh, mm-hmm. in efforts to bring more gender diversity into the industry. Um, so we've talked with many guests, uh, you know, over the years about the the places where cybersecurity has implicitly and ex- at times explicitly been unwelcoming to people of diverse genders, races, economic backgrounds, degrees of able-bodiedness or neurodiversity. So what are some of the specific strategies that organizations like Women in Cybersecurity and CyberX are using uh, to make hiring, creating, and you know leadership roles more accessible to women and uh, other diverse candidates? Sure. So I think... We'll- Awareness is one fundamental area, but I think they're developing programs and pathways in support of pipeline development for diverse talent pools. And that's helping Mm -hmm. the community see more success on this front. There's a shift going on right now um, to attract, retain, and grow resources. Yes. So attracting new talent in the cyberspace, that is happening. And I think companies and organizations um, are now finding candidates that historically didn't exist or they didn't have. Um, I don't remember anyone coming to my school when I was a kid uh, suggesting that girls should be in STEM or a related field. Oh, for sure. Um, Yeah. I I just don't remember that happening. And I know that I've actively been uh, doing outreach and like personally, and I know that that's happening. Um, I know we're not yet reaching all of the schools. 
Like I know that there are, um, there are underrepresented groups that we're not, we're not hitting their schools yet. And right. I know we need to, um, mm-hmm. there's strides happening that are kind of making that, that happen. We're just not there yet. Mm-hmm. Um, I think retaining is an interesting topic. I think companies are very much aware that retaining talent is a key factor. Yes. We need to see more companies invest in their employees. Um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, to go to other companies right now. And if you don't treat your employees well and invest in them, the underrepresented, the diversity of thought, um, I think somebody else will. Um, and, and women in cyber and cyber acts give uh, underrepresented groups the ability to also have a voice in a community that if you don't have that in your own organization, they do feel like they have that. So that's a that's a great win, uh, oh, yeah. in my opinion, um, and something that is very valuable um, there. Yes. Growing resources, I think, like really investing in careers and development as a person. Like we want our people to have a long and rewarding career as with companies. Uh, many studies show that, you know, this is something that, you know, generation, like one or two generations ago, like they stayed with companies for a very, very long time, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think if you find a way to keep an employee, an employee growing uh, in their career, they're going to be wildly successful as an organization. And I think Wieses and CyberX is tackling these problems very well and bringing like minded people together and giving yeah. them a voice and training and supporting and a platform and then connecting businesses to solve this very problem. Um, but there is also a school I need to give a big shout out to is the okay. Rogers Catalyst uh, program at Toronto Metropolitan or Rogers Cyber Secure Catalyst program. Um, okay. They're doing such wonderful things for diversity and those transitioning in their careers as well. So um, those organizations are really trying to capitalize on like finding spaces and and helping people kind of get in there. So, uh, you know, I think that there's, we're, we're not in a place where it's perfect, but I know that there's active movement in oh, in yeah. that area to do to do to do something different, and that's good, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the four years that I've been hosting this podcast, you know, I've seen the conversation mm-hmm. change, you know, mm-hmm. slowly but but real. So originally it was, you know, well, we why hire diverse candidates? We just look for diverse thought, and then it 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 ground slowly towards well, we'd like to hire diverse candidates, but they just never answer our job listings to sort of a slowly (laughs) growing understanding of the need to change the way you market your job listings and where you advertise your job. So where are you seeing us still falling, you know, failing on the job in this uh, regard? And and especially in terms of, of mobility within the organization, how do we go about addressing job mobility in a way that we don't end up having a diverse SOC, but a monocultural C-suite? Right. So uh, 67% more job seekers are now looking for diversity. According to Mm bgc.com, how diverse leader leadership teams boost innovation. That was one of the quotes I had Uh, on a cheat sheet note. Okay. Um, Which is good. Um, uh, This is, this is a good thing. I think many companies have started to develop programs for up and coming diverse and underrepresented talent. Mm -hmm. Um, I know a lot of companies have executive coaching and mentorship and training mm-hmm. programs to show up this gap. Right. Um, and I think there's a strong desire for change and vis- visible action by many co- companies on this front. I know we're not all there yet, but I think that there's a lot more awareness. There's a lot more diversity, um, like, you know, a focus on it right now. And I think we're all coming from a place of learning and, uh, and trying to figure this out. Um, I don't think we have the answer yet in, in a lot of places, but but the more we try and and learn and support these these different um, avenues, the the WESIS, the the um, you know, all of the the blacks in tech, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. I think at the end of the day, if we come from a place of of belonging and inclusion and diversity, I think I think this whole this whole um, ecosystem of cyber talent, it's just it's going to get better. It's going to get stronger, and you know, we nothing's going to stop us. We're going to get this. Yeah. Well, can uh, let let so let's sort of um, you know use our crystal balls here. Where do you see? Uh, you know, these initiatives, uh, you know, in terms of uh, diversity of training, you know, hiring, training, retention, like, where do you see the land? What do you see the, the landscape like in another four or five or 10 years from now? Um, like, what, what what are some of the sort of positive signs that you're seeing that suggest that, uh, you know, things will keep uh, moving in the right direction? Well, I'll tell you, Jen from CISA Gov says, 
by 2030, I think it's 2030, she's hoping we're driving for 50-50 female male representation in cyber by 2030. Yes. So let's hit it. Fantastic. Let's yeah. hit it. I'm going with yeah. her prediction. Let's do it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that's, that's an awesome place to, to wrap up and, uh, and, 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 and something to, to work towards here. So uh, as we wrap up today, if our listeners want to connect and learn more about Lisa Tetro, uh, some of the organizations we discussed uh, and, and more, where can they go online? Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter. I will make sure that all my handles, if you hit me up on LinkedIn, uh, Lisa Tetro, I am on LinkedIn. We'll put it in the show notes. Can we put it in the show notes? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll make sure everything's in the show notes mm-hmm. and uh, I'll get you my Twitter handle and uh, we'll connect there. Love it. Lisa, thank you so much for your time and all your great insights today. This was an absolute blast. So happy to be here. Thanks so much for having me. All right. And as always, thank you all who are listening to and watching the Cyberwork podcast on an unprecedented scale. We've had a great 2022 and we're so happy to have you along uh, for the ride. So uh, I would like to say uh, thank you very much once again to Lisa Tetro. Tetro uh, and thank you all for watching and listening. This is uh, Cyberwork. We uh, uh, release every Monday at 1 uh, p.m. Central Time. So make sure to check us out on YouTube or on your podcast catchers of choice. Uh, but in Until then, we will see you next week. Bye now.